All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to another hour of Sky Shower. I'm Noah. And I'm Jesse. All right, Jesse, welcome back. Hopefully you had another great week and a great Easter and happy Easter to all of our listeners and watchers uh, that do celebrate that holiday. Uh, there's another holiday that went on. I think it was Passover. And uh, I'm not sure if any uh, Muslims listen to us, but if it is, uh, isn't it pretty close to their holiday? Getting Ramadan? very close, yes. All right, so uh, hopefully they have a... A nice holiday as well. And um, so I think we have a pretty decent lineup here tonight. Um, for our scotch, we have the Lafrogue, or did I pronounce that wrong? Lafrogue. Lef- Lef- Sounds good to me. Okay. It's the Lafrogue Select. And uh, then from there, we have our shout outs and get it togethers. Uh, and uh, then our uh, restaurant review, which is Bubba's. Bubbles. Bubbles. And the last thing is our um, smart challenge of the week, which happens to be based on whistleblowers and then a little bit on Snowden and uh, Julian Assange. Scotch review. All right. Well, this week's a love, Freud. Select Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. This one, it could be quite a doozy, if you will. Uh, one of the notes here is that it is uh, aged. The scotch is aged in four different types of casks. Uh, this includes uh, first run ex bourbon casks, American white oak casks, sherry oloroso casks, and ex ziminiz sherry casks as well. Or really, you know, what do they call them? <laughs> They don't call them butts, hoagies, hoggies. Hoagies. I, well, there's like a there's a butt in there. There's a hoagie in there. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if they really knew what they were, what they wanted to do. They were just like, ah, oh, crap. We'll just throw the whole kitchen yeah. sink in there. Yeah. It's like, hey, we're gonna make a new type of pie. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, and then we're just gonna call it select. <laughs> yeah. Select. Yeah. All right. All right. And what region is uh, Lafroig from again? Isla. Isla. Or as we like to say here, Islay. Islay. <laughs> it's from Islay, bro. <laughs> Take off, eh, Jose? <laughs> and uh, how many, um, what's the ABV on this one? This one is a 40, so much like okay. last week's. Another one a little bit lower than uh, some of our more traditional 43s, but that's also more Highland. You know, that's kind of weird. Like for a while there, we we're just hitting like 43s all the time, and now we're back to back 40s. Yeah, 43s, 40, 43, 46, 56. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember that night very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is, uh, standard with uh, their bottles, they've got this handsome green bottle with the white cap and very mature looking. Kind of reminds me of Heineken, partially because we were talking about Heineken's earlier. <laughs> Actually, it, I can see that. It looks like a big Heineken <laughs> bottle almost. <laughs> Um, real quickly on the bottle, do you see a, uh, the, the Royal warrant on there? Like a, like a Royal crest or something on there. There's supposed to be one on every, uh, the Freud. I'm assuming it maybe it's that gold thing. Oh, there it is. Okay. On the back of the bottle. So yeah, back in ooh, 1994, Prince Charles. Uh, he went down to Lafroig or went up to Lafroig and uh, he gave them the his uh, royal warrant there. And from that point on, they put it on every bottle. Nice. Um, so I guess he uh, found some time not to mess around with some uh, underage women with uh, Epstein <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy some scotch. Hey, <laughs> it's medicinal. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, while you're opening that up and pouring it here, a little bit about their uh, history is I think they are founded roughly right around 1810 by the Johnston brothers. Uh, Brother Johnston uh, became the sole owner in 1836. Uh, then somewhere between like nine, uh, 1857 to 1907, uh, they started having some issues with their neighbors and went to went to war with their neighbors there. Why not? <laughs> and then in 1923, Ian Hunter took over the uh, the Freud uh, Distillery, and he was like the last of the of the line there. And from that point, it went over to Bessie, who was the niece of the uh, 
the accountant Willie. All right, uh, Bessie and Willie. <laughs> so I wonder, I'm not, I mean, so it's Uncle Willie. So that's his name, Uncle Willie. He was the accountant. And uh, hopefully he wasn't on the spectrum like Ben Affleck is. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, if he was, then he was a total badass. <laughs> and then so Bessie took over the uh, the secrets to Lefroig. And then that kind of takes us to that 1994 with Prince Charles. And then there's they've done some other things there, but that's just kind of it there in a nutshell. I think did we talked that much about the history um, back when we did the 10 with Brian. I don't believe we did back then. Okay. Well, I do like the color so far. It doesn't look too bad. No, not at all. Anything you want to add on uh, before we uh, cut off for our tasting part? No, we've had some good luck with this region of Scotland, the Isla Single Malt Scotches, uh, typically very peaty, somewhat smoky, and full of body. Uh, a lot of times they'll have a nice medium to medium long finish. I'm hoping we are not disappointed with this evening's selection. Well, I can smell it from here. Some people say <laughs> it smells like Band-Aids. Well, that's the peach. Until <laughs> next time. The Freud select. <laughs> um, so here's what I'm getting here on the color. I put it down as like a kind of like a medium to like gold, medium like gold. And um, as far as the uh, nose goes, nose goes, nose goes, or the bouquet. If I was talking about wines, um, what I kind of put here is I, I do get like, um, I get that initial peat. It's not like a strong peat that I would have expected, like maybe from like the Lefroy 10 or from Lagavulin or Arbeg or something like that. Uh, all those have like a little bit stronger peat on the nose. This one here has, it's a little bit more milder on the peat there on the nose. I do get some hints of uh, citrus and then it also, I get like a, what I put here as a dusty damp oak. And it seems kind of like it seems counterintuitive mm -hmm. for being dusty and and damp, and it kind of reminds me like when you go into like an uh, like an old barn or someplace where you get that kind of like that that dusty kind of smell to it. Following the farmer's daughter for a good time, exactly <laughs> yeah, for a good time of rolling around in the hay. That's right. That's a dusty <laughs> art. <right? laughs> <laughs> and you slide up against some wet wood there. There you go. I mean, you don't. She, she might. Does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, it just kind of gives you that, like that damp wood that you might catch down by, like the the crack or the creek. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> Keep it out of the creek. <laughs> um, as far as the uh, palate goes, my front palate, I'm getting some light peat with citrus. Going to uh, in my mid palate. Uh, with a hint of uh, mint and spice. Mm -hmm. And then my finish, um, and that spice can be pretty nasty when you first open up the bottle. So I would say if you do open up this bottle, let it sit for a little bit open so that way <laughs> <laughs> you don't get attacked by the spice. But then that spice will then lead into what, uh, what I found in my finish being a um, oak, uh, oak with peat and a little bit of barley. And it was about a medium finish. I enjoyed it uh, once it, once it's opened up and kind of I wasn't attacked by the spice. <laughs> so that's kind of my review. <laughs> this slaps. Yeah, that bitch slaps. <laughs> <laughs> All oh, right. Maybe bitch slap it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it did. <laughs> Not once, but thrice. <laughs> <laughs> Not once, but twice. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Was it was like, a, how's that? Uh, do you remember that old movie, uh, I'm Gonna Get You, Sucko? Oh, man. I'm uh, we talk with the, like where they do that pimps that pimp poem or whatever. Oh man, I don't. Uh, through rain, sleet, or snow, the bitch better have my money, not half, not some, but all my cash. <laughs> all right, and that is is uh, eloquent as some hymns get. <laughs> Should have my money. All right, all right. Well, so for me, the scotch uh, also 
kind of like on fire at the front. So uh, color, much like you mentioned, a light gold. And it's it's uh, luminescent. It's it's a bright light gold. It, it catches the light and reflects and refracts very well. Um, the flavor, the nose, starting with that nose, man. It's interesting because at first I didn't get a whole lot, but peat. And now I've got peat, a little bit of citrus, and then a hint of cocoa. Not chocolate, not sweet, okay. but cocoa. Uh, just a hint of cocoa. Now, what's interesting is uh, you go from the nose to the palate, and the first sip for me also was a hot sip and i don't mean alcohol hot it wasn't because it's a 40 percent 40 percent abv it wasn't that burn of cheap alcohol what it was was a citrus kick with spice that rolled on my tongue from front to back <laughs> and it was it was a, it was a surprise a spicy cocoa <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a, she yeah okay <laughs> so I, one of the things i have to think is that they did an interesting job here so they've got their ex oloroso sherry butts they've got their uh zuminez Hoggies, 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 hoggies. It's <laughs> hoggy fest time. That's right. They've got their white American oak cask, and then their first run ex bourbon casks. And with that, I love the fact that you mentioned and you brought up the dusty smell because it is there and it is on the palate and it's not bad. It's actually kind of crazy, which has made me what made me think about rolling around in the hay with a farmer's daughter is because like daughter, daughter. I mean, that's just it. Like you're willing to get dusty. It's that good. <laughs> <laughs> until you till the farmer comes out with the shotgun. Oh, he only tries to scare you. Um, but with that. The, the flavor from the first few sips really develops and um, envelops this sweet and uh, citrusy, spicy package where, yeah, when you first smell it, all you smell is peat. But at the end, once you roll through, for me, as I roll through a sip, I'm getting the peat. A little bit of lemon, just a little bit of lemon. Um, the cocoa you mentioned, mint. It's there, and it's I don't, I don't know. It's not clove. At first, I thought it was clove, but it's you more of like just, it's it's like like a pumpkin pie spices blend, like multiple okay. spices of which one would absolutely be cinnamon, um, and then it rolls to its finish a medium medium to medium long finish for me with um, the peat transitioning to a soft barley, which is one of the things I've really liked uh, from some of the other scotches we've had, the Glen Farkless, the uh, Ben Reax, uh, that, that barley, that wonderful flavor that it rolls out to, uh, with. And so from peat to barley, this is a kind of a fun dram for me. Um, the price point right around Oh, I don't even remember. I think it was like forty four ninety nine or something like so that. So right around the forty five fifty dollar price point, um, and a nice fun treat. Now I will not. I will say it is not for the meek or the light hearted Scotch drinker. It's not for the beginner Scotch drinker. That's yeah. for sure. Or unless you absolutely tasted that Lagavulin eight or sixteen and immediately fell in love like I did, uh, the sixteen was definitely the way to go. She was far sweeter than the eight. And with that, um, that's just this. This isn't uh, super smooth, but it's got a, a interesting flight it'll take you on. I think it opens up more the longer it sits out. That's right. And as we have as a tradition here on Scotch Hour, we have to finish the bottle so it doesn't go bad. <laughs> <laughs> not, not tonight, though. <laughs> It's time for our shout outs. You know what? I'll give a shout out to my mom um, for putting together a, a good Easter dinner. And um, yeah, it was a it, it was a wonderful time, you know, hang out with family and stuff like that. So yeah, I give a shout out to the fam, their mom and fam. 
I, I uh, will give a shout out to the creator of my dinner as well. Um, and it's interesting because she went and bought a honey baked ham. And this thing was not big, but it was still $70. Like, wow, the price. But what I must say is delicious. Thanks, Biden. Yeah. <laughs> it was delicious, though. So uh, shout out goes to actually honey baked ham for continuing a craft and doing something very well. Obviously, you're getting paid a couple times a year during the honey ham holidays and um but it was delicious it was a great meal uh so yeah same shout out um i forget what the doctor's name is uh but uh there was a doctor that like basically a couple weeks ago i meant to say it last week um but um he came out and he spoke out about how uh the uh so-called virus or even maybe the uh the vaccines um might actually be tied to uh snake venom and uh, whether or not, you, I mean, it's a definitely a, a theory that's out there. I'm not saying to believe it or not to believe it. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> Mike, the health ranger on his uh, website, Natural News, he did an interview and a cu couple other people did some interviews with him. And they're talking about peptides. That's going to be uh, the word of the week. Peptides. Uh, but it, apparently the amino peptides, um, the, close, the lower the number is, then that means the closer it is to whatever animal it came from. And the lowest number on the peptide chart there was actually from uh, uh, two snakes, uh, which was uh, the cobra, uh, king cobra snake, and I forget what the other snake was. So there's a high probability if you're going by these peptides and what this uh, uh, what this doctor is talking about um, that the side effects or, or the ailments people are getting from from COVID are, is actually uh, venom poisoning. Which I thought was very interesting. I think it's a it's a very good listen. Um, I would I would definitely recommend uh, checking it out. I'll throw it into our notes um, for the show uh, down below. <clears throat> so if you click on the notes when you watch uh, YouTube or Rumble, or if you listen to our podcast, we have like a listing of all the things down below. The first link though, right there, will be our patrons membership there. So you can click on that, become a patron. But I'll put a link to this doctor, and you guys can uh, check it out for yourself, see whether or not you think it's uh, viable or not viable. But I, I think it's just interesting how people keep doing research and they find new things. And, you know, I just want to give a shout-out for, for them doing the research and keeping an open mind, you know. I, I find it interesting because it doesn't does it surprise you really that that might be in there. No. It doesn't surprise all. me either, and here's why. Um, from a scientific standpoint, we, we have sent doctors and researchers to the Amazon, to all sorts of jungles, uh, to the ocean, to the deep, to the, you know, to the little fish you can't find uh, unless you go at least 5,000 feet deep. All of these different things they have, um, some of them can be used for different medicines. So, it's interesting to me because I think this doctor may not be wrong, but he may also just be not realizing that that was part of the ultimate cure. It was part of the chemistry, a reaction. So maybe they did need he, that peptide to bond the he vaccine. Actually, he does talk about that. He talks about like um, how snake venom is being used in a lot of uh, cosmetics and in uh, a lot of uh, medicine nowadays or big pharma drugs. I mean, there's a reason they say if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. <laughs> uh, but he, Except so he, for COVID. That, that just like <laughs> totally annihilated. So yeah, he, he just talk, he talks about it, but you know, I think he's kind of pointing out that maybe they gotten too far with it, which it could be possible. I, I mean, yeah, they got everything wrong with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess we'll head to our shout outs. Unless you got any, or I mean, to our uh, get it togethers, unless you got any shout outs for yourself. No, that was, yes, I want to give a shout out to myself. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> Looking good, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> no, I'm ready for the get it togethers. All right. What's your first get it together? All right. We've been there before, and we do believe in restaurant reviews, but something that no one I've started trying to redo is revisit some of the restaurants we visited in the past that either had really low rankings to see if they're really that bad, or really high rankings to see if they were really that good. And my get it together for this past week goes to West Main Tap House in Parker, Colorado. 
OMG. It was the polar opposite of the first experience we had there. So going in, the chili cheese fries had adapted. They changed a little bit, didn't have the same green chili oomph. They didn't have that that flavor. Uh, but to really kick it off, and I've got the list on my phone if anyone wants to know it, uh, they've got 50 plus beers, nearly 60 beers on tap. Well, the first 10 I went after, and they were out of, Strike. except for they did have uh, about a uh, two ounce pour of the Lone Tree Double IPA that they brought over to me and set in front of me like a teaser. I was like, that's like the size did of Did you finally get to a point where you're like, all right, well, fuck it. What do you guys have? <laughs> uh, they didn't know. That was the problem. They're like, I don't know what we don't have. But if you ask me, I can tell you whether or not we have it. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, transition very quickly since we're not doing a, a full restaurant review here. Uh, they didn't have, literally, they were out of 10 of the beers I wanted to try. The chili cheese fries weren't as good. The fries that came with my fish and chips the first time were perfect. This time they were not. They were cold. They were limp. No woman wants a limp fry. I didn't either. It was terrible. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was complete polar opposite. It was not someplace I would take a first date knowing that that might be the end result. It was rough. How much of you? How much of it do you think it was due to COVID? Uh, well, if co if that's the case, man, the first time we went there was a few months ago before COVID had completely reopened. Well, we're starting to get like a much larger like supp uh, supply chain breakdowns. Um, I don't think that th that's the case here. I think that it, it was a kitchen issue, that it was a staffing issue. So there could be some pieces with that. But nonetheless, man, you know this as well as I do. <laughs> Being out of 10 out of your 50 beers, poor life choice. So the only reason why I'm asking is because I have gone back before and they were still pretty stellar. And I know you went back before and they were stellar. And then so that's that means we've been there three times. And it's been good, and all of a sudden now they have a bad show. It was bad show. rough. It wasn't just bad. It was, where's the beer, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, I, you know, we we'll may give them another chance, but uh, uh, as it actually turns out, I don't know that after that experience that I'm going to take that risk anytime soon. Especially for their, for their price points. Oh, man, 101 bucks for two meals? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, they're not like, I mean... Yeah, with inflation and all that, they're not a, like a super cheap place to go to anymore. No, so they they fell off of my like top ten ranking list in the oh. in, in the area. Okay, I didn't know you had a top ten. Man, any restaurant I would go back to any day is on my top ten. <laughs> Barolo Grill never let me down. Uh, interestingly enough, Magianos has never let me down. And it's, you know, it's like prepared food. It's completely the opposite of Barolo Grill, sexy Italian. Um, Magianos is fancy, but it's not sexy. It's not homemade. It's, it's not the same. It's also not the price. Um, but yeah, both of those have never let me down. Um, there's, there's many restaurants on that list, but man, this place, it really let me down. Like, I, again, when I say I wouldn't risk, taking a first date there if knowing now knowing that that could be the experience that's a shame it is well um i really don't have a i get it together this week i'm sure i could i could gather one together that's but good because last week's austin martin had me choking on the scotch <laughs> <laughs>
the service. Uh, we like there's a, a table that's sat after us, and they got served before us. And um, I just didn't think the service was really was uh, all that well there. Um, but I did get the uh, the bacon guacamole burger, which was pretty good. Um, although I'm not quite sure if I needed two patties. I Dude, mean, it was huge. It was huge. <laughs> that's what she said. And uh, and then with the uh, and then it came and then I got the side salad with ranch, um, mostly because I heard you suggesting getting ranch when you ordered yours. So the 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 salad was a little interesting because I think I had like crumbled up chips on my salad, but I'm not sure if that those were chips or what it was. Um, if I would have known that, I probably would have asked them to keep that off. But whatever, <laughs> it made for a little bit of an interesting flavor. Salad was really nothing too much to to write home about, but I mean, it was just kind of your standard everyday restaurant fare, regular salad, side salad. Um, but the burger was good. The, uh, they didn't, um, skimp on the bacon, which is really nice. There's some places where they skimp on like, give you like super tiny bacons and they say it's going to be like the apple with thick bacons. And you're like, where's the bacon? So here they did a pretty good job giving you the right, right amount of bacon. It had pepper jack cheese on there. Um, but once again, I think the, the big thing here for me, it probably had just been a one patty burger or giving you a choice of doing one or two patties. You know, life is tough when you're like, <laughs> God damn it. You give me a whole extra hamburger on my hamburger. <laughs> and I didn't want that. Okay. <laughs> exactly. uh, and here's the other thing. I'm not sure if I take a first date there, but I would definitely meet up with buddies there to go watch a game or something like that. And I probably would give it about a, a seven. Yeah. I think that's that's good. Uh, I as well had the bacon guacamole burger, and I wasn't expecting two patties. So when this thing came out, and you see it's like this tall, I was like, "Damn, that's a big burger." <laughs> I probably wouldn't have gotten the side salad if I'd known the <laughs> burger was going to be that big. And it's eight dollar burger night, so that's yeah. a, that's a pretty good deal. It was value wise, it was there tonight. I think regularly it's right on the thirteen dollar mark. Um, still not necessarily a bad value, but for eight dollars, absolutely a good value. My burger was great uh, but it was a lot of food it's a good thing i was hungry otherwise i would have <laughs> been sending like half of it back um just because i couldn't eat it well, you would have been like me where i took out the bud yeah <laughs> <laughs> um the salad to me was great it was fun i liked the little fried chips or um they were almost like uh, paper wafer thin french fries curled put on top and i liked the crunch that they added with my blue cheese and blue cheese definitely does have a different effect with the fry flavor than ranch would so i could see why maybe it wasn't as enticing with your salad but for mine it was great um i ate the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh to your point man i don't know it's not a sexy restaurant no it's but it's a fun it's fine. It's just a sports Very club. casual. Um, first date, no buddies. Second date, you know, just go get a quick meal, on, especially on one of their value nights. Absolutely. Um, I almost think it was the atmosphere. There was something missing in the atmosphere, and I think it wasn't because of the atmosphere itself. I almost feel like it was because of the, the people. You, you know, it might have been. I think you might have, you might be onto something there because, really, when we were in there, it really felt like it should be a sports pub. But there, it seemed like there's like too much, too many families in there or couples in there, and it didn't seem like. I mean, they had the they had the Avalanche game going, they had the Rockies game going, and usually when you're in a sports pub, like a good one, they'll actually have like the game on the. Uh, on the speaker yeah, and there was no noise there yeah. was no energy in this place that is what was missing yeah. was energy something to keep, kick it up a notch or get excited you mentioned the service being one of the hinders i don't think you're wrong there i do think uh we didn't wait long for service uh the bartender slash waiter for the table behind us was different than ours but yeah he was look at he split got them instantly we had to wait a couple minutes still not bad but the energy and the atmosphere of the place left me wanting. That's what was missing for me was like some excitement. Like, yeah. I, th I think if it was more of like a sports, like, or I had more of the sports bar feel to it, it would have been better. Well, let's face it, it environmentally, aesthetically, just from looks, it's far more attractive than, say, uh, Tailgate. 
Yeah. Tailgate's rough inside, but Tailgate has so much energy. Tailgate beats it out. It does. <laughs> and Tailgate's a fun place. And when we go there on burger night, it is the- Even is, two bucks less. You may only get one patty, but that's all you want. <laughs> but, well, even that one patty though is huge. Yeah, it is. It's a great value. So for me, um, it's going to be right. And, and this isn't a, a knock. The food for me was probably an eight. The service for me was a six. The atmosphere for me, for, for me um, not because- of the actual environment itself, but the actual atmosphere, the energy, also a six. Um, all around, though, like even as good as the burger was, it left me wanting. Um, so we're right around right where you said about that seven. I'm going with six and a half um, just because the environment had no energy. You know, I think what it might have added to the energy is maybe like play the – Play the freaking Avs game on the or on some the, music or anything. Well, they had music going, but it was like eighties like pop music, like like Rod Stewart and shit like that being played. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, come on, you got you got two sporting events going, and hockey is way more exciting than than baseball. So throw the hockey up there, put that on the on the overhead speakers. Yeah. So for me, six and a half. I know I, I didn't like really think this whole question out or how to <laughs> approach approach this, but really what I wanted to kind of touch base upon here is uh, whistleblowers, Snowden, and Julian Assange. And um, here, this is what I find interesting with with whistleblowers, right? I mean, we always hear like if you ever like attended like a uh, a corporate training or whatever, <laughs> you sit there, you watch all these videos and, and you like, they talk to you about all this stuff. And one of the things when like when HR comes by and talks about something or you do these <laughs> online trainings, they're always talking about if you see something, say something, you be a whistleblower. And you always hear like, and, you know, and then the government's always talking about like, yeah, you know, something's wrong and we want whistleblowers to step up and stuff like that. But it really honestly seems to me every single time that a person steps up to become a whistleblower, they get bent over and they take it up the butt with no lube. I mean, they honestly, they get screwed over. They lose their job a lot of times. We're talking about like, the Oloroso Sherry butts. <laughs> 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 and it really just i mean it just seems it, like I, I i just don't understand like why anybody would want to be a whistleblower you bring up a good point and we laugh even though it is actually tragic because it's real so uh, i love it when the government's like we want to know stand up tell us what's wrong tell us what's uh, inappropriate where abuse of power is being used. And it's like, well, dude, look in the damn mirror because you get called out time and time again. And as opposed to saying, okay, maybe they don't own it. It's supposed to say, maybe we did something. We should just fix this a little bit. They're like, nope. Uh, yeah, you're a terrorist now in America <laughs> and you've got two choices. And the only other one is if you're lucky, you can escape to a foreign country that it won't extradite you. So hence Snowden <laughs> or Assange or Assange or many of the others. But here's what's even more interesting. Those you still hear about because they were enemies of the state, so to speak. So of governments um, and the governments are held actually are held to a little bit more uh, control. They can't just go out and whack somebody like all these other whistleblowers who, who die. Have you not heard of the Clinton body count? I mean, I have. <laughs> I mean, the Clintons don't, don't play, but I want to be part of it. <laughs> the Clintons don't care. They'll, they'll whack you. I, yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, I'll go smoke a cigar with Bill Clinton. <laughs> Maybe you might want to find something better than Lewinsky there. I mean, he's probably pretty fun right now. He's probably <laughs> like, yeah, she was a piece of trash. It was cool. <laughs> he's kind I of like, do not have sexual relations. <laughs> he's kind of like the, uh, oh, man. Oh, yeah. Matthew McConaughey of presidents. <laughs> it is cool. They stay the same age. Interns. <laughs> you know the best thing about interns? The older I get to. They stay the same age. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, I, I mean, 
a lot of times when you see a whistleblower step up uh, in government or with large corporations, one of the first things you see happening in the in the media is they go to, to discredit the whistleblower. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's against a country or a company. And, I mean, we could look at it. I mean, there's like, I don't know how many examples happen here during like just the past or in COVID with whistleblowers coming out. They've like the media and the government all came out and just try to discredit them, censor them, block them. Um, same things have happened when uh, other uh, people have come out, uh, whistleblowers have come out against the uh, the government or FBI or any, any one of those things. They get discredited and stuff right away. And then, you know, then people are like, oh, well, the mass media says that they're uh, they're bad people, so I believe the government. I mean, you almost I'm, I I I shouldn't say it that way. I, what I will re say is I, I will give a shout out to Elon Musk for buying a, a large share oh, of yeah. Twitter to try to protect exactly that. That was my get it together. Speech. I forgot about my get. That was my get it together. <laughs> hey, the board of directors. <laughs> sorry, it's a little late. Board of directors of Twitter and, and trying to block the, the poison pill. Yeah, doing the poison pill and and well, they're not even let the uh, the shareholders vote upon. That's why it's a poison it. pill. It's, yeah, they should get it together. Yeah, so if you doubling the doubling the cost, come on. Hey, here's what's interesting for those of you that don't know: Elon Musk uh, bought a 13 percent stake of Twitter, and in doing so, became the largest holder of the stock. Now they're talking about dumping it now. Yeah, so that's just it. So here's what's crazy: is so when he did this, at first he's like, "Yeah," and they're like, "Well, you should become a chair member." As a chair member, you can't be a controller; you can't be an owner, so to speak. So he's like, "No, nah, I actually don't think I'm going to go that road. I think I'm." to become the sole proprietor so to speak or the controller if you will the owner and they didn't like that so they created a poison pill which is a very real thing it's a it's a company thing and what it does is it allows the company to sell additional stock for the need uh, the purpose of to the to the shareholders, yeah. To, so so Elon Musk's thirteen percent stake can drop. drop and become less, and someone else can have more. Here's the problem with that, and I think this is where you were going: is it, all of a sudden each one of those shares is now, if you double the the count of stock, each one of those shares that's out there is really only worth half the value. And then if Elon Musk does sell his, dude, Twitter's in the toilet. Twitter's going to be in the toilet either way. And here's the worst part, though, is like they're not even allowing the uh, stakeholders to vote upon whether or not to uh, to sell. And that's and that's that's a big mistake, uh, I think, on because uh, really where the price was, was like at twenty five dollars, and Elon Musk was uh, was offering like forty five dollars. That's a huge that's a huge thing. They're almost doubling their money there per share, and um, so they're doing their they're doing the um, shareholders a disservice. Yeah, yeah, they really are. But anyways, uh, back to uh, and, 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 and talking about whistleblowers, this is almost on the same uh, lines there. If Elon Musk does happen to get a hold of the company and he is able to like look at all the information there, what could he release? Ah, well, that's an interesting point, but even a bigger point, and I don't know that he would release anything because I actually think he believes in protecting people's privacy. Although I will say, interestingly enough, he really doesn't go out of his way to protect his own. He like lets a lot of his information out. But with that, if he's just a smart guy, and we know he's a smart guy, then he uses this as a tool to springboard to ruin Twitter's value and then start his own. Yep. There's there's been talk like if he does get it, uh, uh, there might be a, like a, a, a joining of uh, Truth Social <laughs> with Twitter. That'd be interesting. Trump and Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, And Biden. Good tweet, Biden. <laughs> da, 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 da. Did you see Biden though too? Like the other day, at the, <laughs> where he goes, like he got done speaking and goes to hand, do a handshake, and there's like nobody there, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's like looking around, and, and then he turns around, there's still nobody there. He's like looking all confused, and then eventually he just walks away. <laughs> Get it together. Yeah. I, I just want to say, at, at some point, I was actually thinking about this and talking about this with Noah tonight. Um, and it's one of these things where when you elect a president, 
and then they start to do things wrong, do you in fact own part of the responsibility for his actions? Because you gave him the power. And it's interesting to me because a lot of people I have spoken to absolutely will not own any of the consequences. They complain about the position they, they are they in. They voted for that idiot. They, they own it. <laughs> well, that's just it. But they do, most of the ones, actually everyone I have personally talked to that's willing to talk to me about it, um, won't doesn't own the fact that yeah, I made a mistake and it's costing me twice as much for everything. That just that right that just them, everybody, right? But they're, they're what brings up my conversation with them is they're complaining about the things Biden is doing, and I'm like, who did you vote for? <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah. Also, environmentalist. I just want to say, eat dirt because that's environmental. Uh, Biden reopened the pipelines. <laughs> uh, so anyways, going back to whistleblowing uh, and uh, Snowden. Um, so what did you get from Snowden or what, what do you remember, of, like, what happened? You know, the biggest thing I think that I would emphasize is there's a gentleman, this is 2013, who is hired uh, as a contract worker, uh, previous experience with Dell Computer. So he's got a strong base uh, for his craft and then also a little bit of work with the CIA. So already trust in privy. Now here's where it gets cloudy for me. Um, did he do something that was wrong or did he do something that was right? Well, he was hired for a specific job that he deviated from. And to me, that means he was actually the one spying on many things. So in that point, he was wrong. Now, what he uh, let out, the news he lets out, makes it pretty controversial um, and, and it's tough. But what he basically did was go in as a contract worker, find a bunch of stuff he was surprised to see. Well, that supposedly isn't supposed to be happening. Uh, the government working with many companies, big phone companies, um, uh, data supply companies, finding out that they're all spying on us, the average human American or citizen of any number of countries for that matter, because it's all international. That's uh, 2013. It's not that long ago. You're talking about 11, uh, nine years ago. And uh, they're spying on everyone. They're collecting data with everyone. And this is supposed to be something that we are protected from. We weren't getting it. So he eventually goes off to Hawaii, meets with a bunch of legit reporters. Well, in Hawaii, he's working for the NSA, and that's where he discovered all that stuff. Right. And so ultimately, he flees to Russia, gets a one-year pass, extends that year after year after year, and then just this, uh, you know, two years ago, during COVID, <laughs> by the way, um, finally gets amnesty and a lifelong sentence to Russia, which is interesting because why do we hate Russia? <laughs> so so one part, though, I think you kind of missed there is when he actually was doing, he, he did work with the CIA, and then he left the CIA, and then he started doing contract work. And when he was in Japan, he wrote a uh, a program to, that does the data mining and stuff like that. But it was supposed to be for a backup. And then when he went to Hawaii, he's, he discovered that they were using his program to be actively doing data mining for uh, all, the, all the people in the United States as well as our allies and stuff like that. So really, it reminds me of Scottie Pippen during, uh, what, what year was that? Ah, shoot, I can't remember exactly right now, but during his uh, sixth championship season on the Bulls with Air Jordan, and he decides he doesn't, he, he, he deserves more. I guess, I'm guessing Snowden, Edward Snowden, there was probably pissed off that he didn't get the recognition. That's probably the real problem. He's like, you're using my program and I'm not even getting any credit. He's probably pissed. He might have been pissed, but I mean, also at the same time, I think part of the reason why he left the CIA is because he didn't like what he was doing and like how they were starting to violate people's rights. Uh, I mean, that could be the possibility there. I mean, that's the kind of like, and I'm not sure I've done like a whole ton of research, but that's kind of the feeling I got from the movie based on Snowden. I think, yeah, and, I think at, at this point, at least in America, you have to be ignorant not to think that the government is spying on you. They know exactly. your tax numbers before you do, but they still make you file. <laughs> but uh, the one thing I would say, like, even though when he did pull, like when he did, uh, when he pulled that flash drive out and stuff like that, and, uh, and he did release information, some of the biggest things I think people didn't realize at the time was uh, like, you know, and 
and you're still you're still silly enough and i i know i do it but i'm aware of it anyways is that they they can activate your camera on your phones they can activate the camera on your on your laptop or your desktop cameras they can uh activate your microphones on there uh i remember and i think they do it re i think they do it for a reason now because phones now you can't pull out your your battery and uh if you notice it was shortly after snowden kind of like talked about that when it also became really big for cell phone companies to switch over to having the full backs where you can't take the batteries out you can you just have to work at it there's two little tiny screws at the bottom that you pull it all out <laughs> you're good it just takes a minute yeah i mean it's not like before where you just like slide it off and just pop it right out battery technology that it's actually removing batteries does a lot of harm science i'm going to use the science backup <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to use the, you can use the science backup if you want, but uh, if you want to have uh, privacy from. Don't have eyes, a phone. Well, <laughs> you don't have to have a phone, but. I mean, I mean, they're fun, right? That's why I put it in my butt pocket, by the way. If they <laughs> want to turn on my camera, they're like, oh, look, Jesse's ass. <laughs> it's a nice ass. <laughs> All right. Um, so for me, I, I think he, I see how the government will, because they, they want to keep secrets and stuff like that. Um, and if they were doing everything, uh, I guess correctly and, uh, morally right, uh, then I would say like what he did would have been wrong. But I, I think by them doing the data mining without getting, uh, with, cause I think it violates, I think the fourth amendment in our constitution, um, uh, because I don't think they, they don't have the right to just data mine you. Um, but well, that's what opinion. reporters do, and they've got the right for journalism. Uh, they don't have the right to data mine you for everything. Yeah, that's they basically do. what they do, though. They steal photos from models, from actresses. They're all crooked, too. I didn't say they weren't crooked. I'm just saying that, they, you know, they shouldn't. Uh, I can. Yeah, I just don't think the government should be able to do that. But Right, but you're asking that we give that grant that privilege to a journalist to I'm not even asking to give it to anyone. I'm not even saying to give it to the journalist either. Right, but they that's exactly what they do. They come and they pry and they ask uh, for all the information in a hot If they topic. ask you that's one thing, but the government's not even asking. They're just doing and taking and they're data mining you without your knowledge. Right. And I think that's what a lot of these journalists do as well though, is they go and they're like, Okay, I'm gonna wait for here to come out her front door for 12 hours. Okay, now it's two days. Oh, there, there's Britney Spears nude and high on crack. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they should be doing that crap either, but that's that's just me. I, I'm just saying it's interesting because there are two sides and the journalists want the side of, well, freedom of press. Um, but Yeah, but they're just a propaganda machine. They shouldn't be doing any of this. Shit. Right. I'm, I'm just saying it's interesting because no matter what side you're on, if you're breaking the law to wrongs, don't usually make a right. Yeah, I would say them. I agree with that. But I think in this case, what Jordan, what, what Snowden did on some of it was justified. I think they, I think people needed to know that the government was had the capability of turning on your camera without you knowing it, or turning on the mics on your phones or your laptops without you knowing it. I think that's I think that's justified. I can't believe people didn't already know that. That's what's crazy to me. Like, oh wait, wait, now it makes sense. They voted for Biden. God. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even have to say it. <laughs> I take it all back. Yes. People it, are that least. dumb. When... <sighs> <laughs> all right. I'm just going to pour another drink and realize <laughs> the world I live on. <laughs> it's a very scary world out there. Oops, all, right. No. all right. How about uh, so anything else you want to say about Snowden? No, I think it's interesting. And, and uh, for me, I don't think he did for me, I, and this was part of your question, you know, is he a terrorist? They literally deemed him a terrorist. Um, and I don't see it that way. Now, I don't think what he did was right. Do I think it's something that this guy should be potentially punished to death from? Because that's what terrorism is. Um, especially when it's an act against your own country. Um, it's interesting because no, but um, yeah, it, I don't think what he did was right, but to me, he was no terrorist. I think the government went a little bit too far because he I just brought out some information before they wanted it out. Weren't they trying to like trump him up as a traitor rather than a terrorist? That is exactly it. And that's what I mean. Uh, that's the word I should have used uh, because traitors are punishable by death in America. 
Yeah, and I think here, I don't think, I don't consider him a traitor. I don't consider him a terrorist. Um, I agree because he didn't act against the nation. Yeah, I don't think, I, think, I don't think he acted against the nation. I think he, act, he acted in the greatest good for the nation uh, by letting people know like, hey, the government is violating your rights in these areas. But here's the thing is like, I don't really blame him for how he did it either because what happens to whistleblowers? And we're not talking about the music whistleblower. Because <laughs> <laughs> whistleblowers, like, they, they, some of them end up being, like, mysteriously dying. There's no mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, I think uh, I can see where, you, where you're coming from there. But for me, I think, uh, I think he was uh, doing something that was right. Um, and I can't fault him for how he did it because if he did try to go through the normal whistleblower type of lines, um, I think, uh, he would have been worse off. And where is he now? He's in Russia, but I don't think he's living a bad life in Russia. I don't think he is either. He's got rubles for days. <laughs> I think he's one of those people who's kind of like, uh, the guy from Wolf of Wall Street. I think he, he Oh yeah. I think he loser. Won. No. <laughs> I think he won. He did win all the money from all of his uh sellings of secrets. Now the one person I think who is losing, and I don't think I think well, he got the the bum deal here is Julian Assange. Now, where is he living now? London, right? Yeah, he's like in he's in uh, custody in London. Yeah. And for a while he was he was basically like a prisoner inside the Ecuadorian uh uh embassy. Yeah. It's just interesting because why don't they just move him over? Because he has secrets of theirs too, is the real answer. <laughs> well, uh, he, he's uh, well, he's in the UK uh, system now. But um, so with him, he was technically not a whistleblower, right? He just uh, started a nonprofit organization for whistleblowers to use as a medium. So he was like, hey, I'm going to start a company where whistleblowers can post their stuff. And keep their identity secret. Right. Because he knew, just like we know, that if you <laughs> if you blow the whistle, that you're, you're, you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think what he did was a great thing to, to allow for people to come out and become whistleblowers and uh, – and, uh, to expose a lot of these, a lot of these things, they like uh, brought down a bank who is doing like, uh, I guess, uh, not appropriate loans. <laughs> I mean, what was wrong? Uh, and, but then you know, then what came out is like what happened with like the U.S. government, where there was the uh, the video uh, where they used the drones and killed two innocent Reuters uh, uh, reporters. And an and 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 innocent bystander that was helping out one of the reporters. I mean, and the kid, I think the kids were in the van too. Yeah, it's, it was ugly. It was bad. Uh, it's an act of war. So, wait a minute. So, that is what we are blaming Putin for doing, and that's a war crime. Yeah. Interesting. But it was an American war crime, so it's not really a crime or a war crime. <laughs> it was just. Oops. Yeah. So I think what he, what, what Julian Assange and WikiLeaks were doing, I think uh, initially it started off like a, a good thing where I think uh, Julian Assange probably screwed up is when he released a bunch of those uh, uh, Afghanistan documents is he didn't redact. Uh, because like, I mean, there, I think there's a fine line to walk there with um, protecting people who are innocent, uh, but could, but could end up getting killed or injured because of who they've helped out or the information that they shared. Um, cause they're like an informant. And, uh, I think that's where he might've screwed that up. But at the same time, I also get Julian Assange's stance where he's like, if he's, if they are helping out the enemy, then they deserve what they get. I mean, think about it this way. Like if someone was, uh, in the United States helping out like China, and then their name got exposed and they ended up getting caught as a traitor and killed. Well, that would make sense. Right. But at that point, if what he was doing was no different than the government using information incorrectly. I don't think, well, was he really using it incorrectly? I mean, he did, he did post all of it. Making money, posting all of it. Uh, originally he didn't, he wasn't trying to make money off of it. Originally. 
but, people started uh, donating. People started donating, and, and like so, I, I won't really say I won't really give him like say that he was going after to make money. Where did his money, his backing come from? So Snowden was a contract worker. He was making great money doing the work he was doing. That was not in question. Where was Julius's money come from? Um, I don't know where it came from originally at the beginning part. Russia. Uh, <laughs> but I do know like later on it came from contributions, so which would be no different than any like YouTuber or social media person. It's interesting because I imagine there's there's a dark side, which is why he's locked up. Well, I think the reason why he's locked up is because of the, the of the secrets that he left. Huh? He should have gone to Russia. <laughs> Probably, but I think Russia was pissed off at him too. They were because he burned everyone. You can't burn all the bridges. You're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, like if you look at like uh, journalism, if I think here's a big question: here is is do you do you see WikiLeaks as a as a uh, as a form of media, like a news media a journalist? If that's the case, and then they would be protected by releasing this information, and they didn't really do anything wrong the other thing here too is we have to look at is uh the manning guy i forget what his name something manning turns into he turned into a woman after he got out of prison or whatever but it was that private who released all those documents and they too. say prison doesn't change people <laughs> whatever <laughs> uh and then so they released all those doc he that that guy released something uh something manning uh but anyways manning released all the documents to wikileaks and um, and I, and I think the U S government is trying to say that, that Julian Assange, uh, talked Manning into giving them that, that information, which I, I can kind of see in a roundabout way, because I think at one of the hacker, um, conferences or whatever, he did put out there, even on WikiLeaks there, like, uh, here's our, like our top 10 wanted list of whatever. And one of them was like, like U.S. black sites and U.S. you know things in like in, in, in Afghanistan and stuff like that, and so he got it. But honestly, I don't think uh, he's mining for information at that point. He's <laughs> he is mining. I guess so. Yeah, he's asking if he's asking for it. Then I guess he's mining it. But he's not actually mining it. He's looking for a whistleblower. Right, right. But as soon as you create a platform for people to give secrets that are pissed or burned or want to do something to hurt someone else people don't do this for good most cases um then you're also mining you've found another way to get that information yeah i mean but do you think like the government should have held back on what they did to those journalists no absolutely not but you know i think a Few Good Men is one of the best movies in history in, on the planet. You want the truth? You, you can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson, Demi Moore, she fell off the boat. Uh, Tom Cruise, but Jack Nicholson's role in that quote will forever stay true to my heart. People can't handle the truth. Most people. Most people can't handle the truth, but at the same time. Uh, I mean, we did our taxes. We know money's no object. <laughs> <laughs> Only because we saw on a spreadsheet, money is no object. <laughs> Anyways. I can handle the truth now. At this point, I'm just like, God damn. Money really was no object in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it came from. <laughs> WikiLinks. <laughs> Anyways, uh, IRS, if you're watching this. We, 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 we oh, documented no. everything. IRS, if you're watching this, please, and we both mean this sincerely, audit us. Cause we no, don't audit me. Yeah, dude, audit me because I only use like half of my deductions. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure if they audited me for, for this year, for 2021, I'll come out ahead. But yeah, I'd you rather, would. <laughs> I, I'd rather not go through that hassle. But then you can talk about it on the show. Yeah. yeah and the true. IRS can be the bad guy and it could be the best episode ever. It will go along with our American fascism. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to pay my taxes? Well, literally, we can. Yeah, we got this. Back, Anyways, back, to, back to your subject. Uh, actually, I, I really don't have anything else to say. I, I think uh, Julian Assange should be acquitted uh, or whatever. I don't think he should be arrested. I don't think what he necessarily did was wrong him personally. Maybe he shouldn't have released the documents like he did. 
uh, that's questionable. But at the same time, if the governments aren't doing something shady to begin with, then we wouldn't really have to worry about this stuff in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I'm going to go back to a few good men. I don't think most people can actually handle the truth. And I think that's why the government doesn't put it all out there. Uh, it's a scary world and it's only getting scary these last couple of years and probably these next couple of years. Um, so, so I don't think either one of them are necessarily criminals, but I don't believe that everything they did was right. Uh, I would give you that. I mean, maybe they, maybe they did not go about it the right way. The term traitor is the wrong term. Term trader is a wrong term, yes. Because for me... Terrorist be, is a wrong term, too. Right. For me to be a terrorist or a traitor, but I'm going to stick with traitor in this instance, you have to go against the people of the country, not the country itself. And I don't know that everyone understands that when you think about uh, the term traitor. You're not being a traitor to one or to a group of the government. Um if you're a traitor, that's not the case. When you're a traitor is when you go against the mass, the people. And that's where the question comes in. Were these two going against the masses? No, they were actually trying to be heroes and protect the masses, but they just went about it the wrong way. You now, know, the struggle is there was no right way. So here's another thing to look at when you mention like they're trying to be the heroes. Oftentimes heroes in their time are seen as the villains. Yeah, no, it's by, by the government. It's, oh, absolutely. So here's, I think here's a case where probably with both Snowden and Assange, by the by the terms of the governments, they were they were criminals or evil or bad people. But I think later on, they they're going to be probably heroes that will be recognized because really what Assange did with WikiLeaks is he changed the whole information game uh, for news and stuff like that for the you know how the masses get it. And I think that's where you start getting more and more of those alternative news sources and stuff eventually. Yeah. Because we obviously know we can't trust the mainstream media. Oh yeah, for sure. Any, okay. Yeah. If you guys are watching the news and <laughs> if you're watching the news, turn off the TV. No, nah, just, if you're watching the news, just realize they're lying to you. Many of those are lies. Yes. My favorite is the one in Ukraine when they're driving down the road. This is still my favorite. They're driving down the road trying to film all the Russian war crimes and deaths, and all of a sudden they forgot that there's rearview mirrors on these tanks that they're driving down these roads, and the people that were supposedly Ukrainian shot dead are, like, getting up because they <laughs> thought they the, were off the camera. <laughs> or you see the one where they, as they're driving by, they wave their hand, hi. <laughs> all right. Ridiculous. Uh, so, uh, so what that told me, Ukraine is more corrupt than any of them. Well, yeah, we already knew that, though. Right. I'm just saying Ukraine is more corrupt. So everyone who's feeling sorry for the Ukrainian president, for example, and that press that put out that video, WikiLeak. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wiki, WikiLeak right there. It's, it's fake news. All right, so uh, I think bottom line, I think we could both agree that possibly what they did was uh, not the best way of going about doing it, but knowing how whistleblower laws or what happens to whistleblowers, um, I can't really, I can't really blame them for choosing the routes that they chose because maybe they couldn't see a viable one to go with. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Traders, no. Traders, no. Terrorists, no. Uh, I don't even think they're criminals. That's where it gets tricky because they were they had signed contracts. Like for me, yeah, give them their two years, slap their well, wrist. Well, Assange didn't and, sign a contract. Well, good point. Snowden did. <laughs> Snowden had signed a contract and had also sold his goods. By the way, he's the one. If he's a criminal, it's because he's the one who created the software that enabled the government. He's upset about that. You did this. Like, so, yes, he was complicit, I think, in creating this software, but at the same time, he realized... That's a good point. But maybe, you know, I think when he originally created the software, I think they, he was probably lied to with, with what they're going to utilize right. for. Right, and it's interesting because it's no different than, say, someone who created the A-bomb. Are they therefore the criminal or not? They 
had advanced intellect to create this thinking it wasn't going to get used or did you have to know it could get used that sure was he knew it could get used but i think here's the point though like you have the guy who creates a bomb if he goes out and creates a bomb knows that it could be used i think he has a duty to the populace to let them know like hey i made this fucked up shit here it's gonna blow up everybody <laughs> Didn't just blow up people. It mutated. <laughs> <laughs> not funny. Toxic Avenger. <laughs> yeah, it's literally not funny. But I'm laughing. I'm and I'm part Japanese, man. Dude, just saying. <laughs> I, I I need to shut up. Nothing <laughs> right can come out of this mouth right now. <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh. For for you, for any of our viewers or listeners, if you made it this far, uh, please uh, leave a comment. Let us know what you guys think. Yeah, I, I want to wrap up with one of my favorite lines in a movie that really talks about power and the abuse of power is actually in the original Iron Man movie, um, Robert Downey Jr. And he's being questioned by a reporter and she's saying, do you think this is right? And he's like, let me tell you how it is. My old man taught me the man with the biggest stick wins. And that can be the A-bomb, it can be a, any number of things. And really what these two individuals did was take that stick out of the government's hand and the government didn't like it. And the government rebelled against them because they had rebelled against the government, not against the people of America, but against the government. And that's where it gets interesting and ugly and where my own internal right versus wrong is torn because they didn't hurt the people of America. What they did do was make America face that the government was doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing. Do you think basically here too that they might have uh, were the the adults in the room saying hey uh, America like this is what our government is doing Time to time to wake up a little bit. See, again, that that's an interesting analogy, but I don't think that's exactly the appropriate analogy because I think it's usually the kids who are the ones you're like, Daddy said yes, <laughs> Mama said no, <laughs> and it gets ugly. Um, so like the adult piece, I don't think adults, I think actually the adults find a better way. I think what they were were probably two people who for different reasons were internally stricken, not strong, not adults it, in that moment when they did their first steps that they ultimately couldn't undo. Yeah. I don't know. So what if you were in their position and you know what happens to whistleblowers, how would you go about something like this? I'd be like, okay, guys, hey, here. I think there's some stuff that's going on wrong. I need a fatter paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the Wolf of Wall Street, and I think this is the right way to play this. Because <laughs> I can't change the fact that, and he didn't, change the, the fact that the government was mining information. That never changed. If anything, it only got stronger. And on the other side... Do you think Americans on a whole got more aware, though? Not to a point where it made a difference. It was too late. The government was already doing it. We can't control it. It's, it's too late. Here's where you and I rest well at night. We pay our taxes on time. Or we get our refund on time. We don't lie, cheat, or steal on those. We don't lie, cheat, and steal and, and hurt other people. And, uh, you know, if the government is looking at us, we don't make all the right decisions, drink responsibly, but we make the right decisions to stop them coming after us. And that's where it's really interesting to me because I remember when this whole thing first came out with Snowden and my mom of all people was the one who's like, what do you think of all this? And I, my response to her was not what she wanted to hear. My response was, I don't do anything wrong. So if the government wants to know all my information, I'm still the same person. I'm not going to jail. I'm not doing any time. I didn't do no, anything but wrong. That, I don't think that's really the point, though. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have the ability to do that in the first place. Right, but what, do you, what is the fear if you're not doing anything wrong? It's not the fear. It's more like they don't have the right to do it. Right, I get that. I do actually get that. But the fear versus right versus wrong comes in. What wrong are you actually being done if they know that? 
I think here's the thing is like if you if you allow the if you allow a person or a government or a company any bit of leeway, right? They're gonna take that and then some. And companies, and, corporations do it all the time. We both then, work for some. And then when they do that, then they're gonna ask for more. And when they ask for more, they're gonna do that, they're gonna take more. And there's you have to draw a line somewhere. And I think here it doesn't matter if like, yeah, I'm not doing anything wrong, so what do I care if they're if they're peeping into me? No, it's just wrong. They shouldn't be doing it in the first place, and then that needs to come to a stop. Right, but it won't. We can't control that. It's too late. By the time Snowden came out, it was too late. I get that by the time he came out, it was too late. You can't even live off the grid anymore. There's satellites that'll find you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you know this. I know this. <laughs> Ted Kaczynski knows it. <laughs> right? Literally, you can't get him off the grid. So, literally, get here's the thing, and this is where, interestingly enough, we talk about the five things that are our strengths that we want to be known for: um, adaptability, resilience. Maybe it's not such a strength, but guess what? Wake up! Just if you live your life knowing that everything you do wrong, you could get caught for, you might live a different life. The the only thing I'd say here is. The, the way I'll finish this, I guess my part of the segment up is, is just be more aware of like the government has the capabilities of watching you, listening to you, all these types of things. And the only thing you can do like is, is try to minimize the amount of footprint that they can track on you. That, that's all I'm saying is to try to do like, I mean, yeah, you're it, the cat's out of the bag. We can't put the cat back into the bag. Well, you might be able and to. Not, not only has the cat been out of the bag, now the cat's like a freaking tiger. And it's definitely not going to go back into some like little some little like brown bag anymore, right? So it's at this big point. Coat, not a little coat. <laughs> so at this point, it's a monster. It's growing. And the only thing you can do, and you're right, you can't, you can't really get off the grid at, at this point anymore with all the cameras and stuff like that. The only way you can start trying to walk back some of those things is start putting laws back into place and bringing privacy back into the people's lives. But at this point, it's probably too far gone to where we can even do that. So the only thing that people can do is be aware of it and try to minimize the amount of like electronic footprint that they're putting out there. If you're worried about that stuff. That's the whole point. What are you worried about? I, here's what I'll finish up with. If you're worried about them watching you, put on a good show. <laughs> Give them something where they'll a stop helicopter. and watch you. <laughs> Look at this. Make sure it's not underage people you're with. <laughs> Again, don't do Biden. anything wrong. <laughs> Biden. Which one? Either one. <laughs> Him, his son, all of them, all of them, whatever. But the dad's in there smelling like little girls' hairs and stuff like that. Dude. <laughs> Strawberry. What? <laughs> And caressing them in places they shouldn't be. Yeah, we got we got a pedophile for president. And on that note, drink responsibly. <laughs> be aware of your digital footprint. I think uh, is what Noah is trying to say. For me, if you got nothing to hide, they got nothing to pry. <laughs> All right. So, what's next week's uh, smarter challenge? As we mentioned last week, we're writing some letters. I haven't done any letters yeah, yet. Yeah, dude. So snail mail for a reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, and I think that this will ultimately come into a longer challenge, but to not fully deplete a challenge, the movie. It is to analyze the movie The Gentleman by Guy Ritchie and look at the main characters and kind of assess were they good people, were they bad people, uh, who would you want to be in this movie, and what do you really think about this movie? So Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman, starring Matthew McConaughey. Uh, uh, that's you know I think that's the biggest one, um, and the Scotch man. I, I just, you know, we're going to go bigger with Guy Ritchie. I, I believe that. That's why I just didn't, like, land it all there. But the scotch for Guy Ritchie. It's just going to be Jura. Okay. Just Jura 10 uh, for Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman. Uh, nice little copper 
canister. Not so sure about the bottle, but uh, that's where we'll go. Jura, The Gentleman by Guy Ritchie. All right, sounds good. All right, anything you want to say to the people before we clock on it? No, I think you give us some feedback. Uh, let us know what you think. We're going to get into some other subjects and topics. Let us know what you think about this subject and this topic. Were they traitors? Were they terrorists? Uh, good, bad, right, wrong. And uh, thanks for watching. All right, well, first of all, thank you, Jesse, uh, for all the listeners and uh and viewers out there, thank you for making it this far. Uh, we do greatly appreciate you uh, being patrons of ours. Uh, if you want to become a paid patron, just look down below. Take that first link. It is for the uh, Podbean patron. You can be, uh, you can do as low as a dollar a month. All that does go back into our podcast here for us to reinvest. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess if you're watching this, we're on YouTube and Rumble. Audio is Podbean, Spotify, Google Podcast, uh, and Audible. Uh, did I say Audible? Uh, you maybe, maybe if I didn't say Audible before, it's Audible. Um, and uh, so, anyways, thank you guys uh, once again. Hopefully, you all have a wonderful evening. Same Scotch time, same Scotch channel. Life is great life is great you're not gonna do your little scotchman we hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of scotch hour if you did please like share and subscribe also if you have not done so already please become a patron member with memberships starting as low as one dollar a month thank you and hopefully you have a wonderful evening